Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. So I guess the question is, why church or is it relevant today or not relevant and what's been your experience? It should be relevant. I really do believe that. For me at least, uh, church isn't that relevant because I feel that just church in general and church in religion is just encouraging you to be a good person and do good things. It's, it's relevant. I don't think it's like the center of people's lives anymore. Hey, good morning. How you guys doing? You guys are awake? Yeah? All right. Hey, if you're tuning in online, welcome. We're glad you guys are here. I know some people are traveling this weekend, and uh, I know you guys are going to be watching because you should be going to church. So I'm excited you guys are here this morning. My name is Chris. I serve as the family pastor here at ACC, which means I hang out with a bunch of kids, and it's super fun, uh, and I like to do what I do. I get to close out this uh, week uh, our series that we started back after Easter called Why Church? Kind of answering the question, why does what we do here week in and week out matter? Or does it? Is there any benefits to being a part of a local church or not? And so we've ha kind of been over the last four weeks kind of tackling some benefits that you might have in being a part of a local church. And so today I'm wrapping it all up and we're going to uh, conclude this series and we're really excited about it. Uh, just to kind of uh, pivot for one second, if you're a guest in the room, uh, or this is your, you know, you're new here and you haven't ever seen me speak before, um, something that's uh, a little odd to some people is that I always teach barefooted. It doesn't matter if it's winter or summer. Um, and I want to address why I do that, give you some clarity hopefully this morning as to why I do that. Uh, there's uh, two passages in Scripture that I love. In Exodus chapter 3, it's a guy named Moses, and in Joshua chapter 5, it's a guy named Joshua, who had this encounter with God, this face-to-face -face encounter uh, with God. And in that moment, God tells them to take off their shoes because the ground on which they're standing on is holy ground. And I was always kind of flabbergasted by this passage uh, because I'm like, well, uh, what's, you know, what's so special about that dirt? It's not. You go walk on the same dirt, climb the same mountain, you can do all that stuff uh, where a lot of the heroes of the faith have been. The only thing that changed was that God was there. And God's presence changed the entire landscape. And so I believe uh, when I stand on stage here or anywhere else that I'm preaching God's word, the presence of God is here. And so I remove my shoes uh, just as a sign of respect and reverence before him, uh, recognizing that it's him speaking through me and not me. So I just want to kind of address that really quickly in case you're looking going like, why does that dude not have shoes on? Um, I, that's why. So uh, I want to start with a, uh, with a question. I want to start with a reflection. And maybe you've only had one cup of coffee and reflection's not quite in your blood yet, but we'll, take it for later then. That's fine. Uh, but here's the reflection. I want you to think about the deepest relationships that you have, the, the closest friendships that you have. I'm not talking about family. Throw them out, which for some of you are like, praise God. Like, but no, just think about it for a second, right? The deepest friendships that you have, the closest people, the people you can tell anything to. Think about those people. Where do they come from? I would say that probably most deep friendships come from time, right? Built over time, built over uh, doing things together. But really, at the end of the day, it comes because... Uh, you value them over yourself in some way, shape, or form, that you seek to serve and love one another. Very rarely do you see a friendship blossom where you're just like, hey, I know you, you're going to be my friend, we're best friends now, I'm going to tell you everything about my dark past. That doesn't really happen. If that's you, I would question all of your friendships. That's kind of, uh, kind of, no. But here's the deal, right? Oftentimes, time is what helps us build those relationships. I'll give you an example. Um, I met my wife 14 years ago, 2005. I said 2015, uh, last service. Nope, 2005 is when I met her. 14 years ago. Now, my wife and I celebrate our ninth wedding anniversary on Wednesday, which is super exciting. Yeah, come on. Yeah, you're welcome, baby. She's watching online. She'll be here at 1130. Don't judge her. So, but here's the thing. Uh, we have two small kids, right? It's tough to get them up in the morning. But here's, here's what I love. When we first started, uh, when we first met, we didn't meet, and we're like, we're going to be married. That's going to happen. 
No, when we met, we were like, hi, I'm Chris, hi, I'm Renee, great, you're in that cabin, because I was, I, I, don't, I don't know who she was, I didn't care who she was, honestly, just wasn't my thing. So it took us a while, right? Our first, first year of friendship was small talk. It was like, hey, how are you, how are you, great, here's a cool, fun story about my life, here's a cool, fun story about my life, and then we went on. But then as the years progressed, we began to see some traumatic things happen that we walked through life with each other. Uh, things like uh, we walked through the death of our grandparents together. Uh, we walked through uh, some traumatic uh, losses in our lives. Things that, uh, that often draw people together. We served together at that camp for years. Uh, we served on mission trips together. We began to just spend time together serving one another, focusing on others rather than ourselves. You know, true community is hard to find. Like, finding where you fit and belong is difficult. Especially when you get into a church this size, or a church really anything, anything bigger than like five people, it's difficult to find people that you can really connect with. It takes time and work and energy and effort. And, and I'm not saying uh, that today I'm going to come up with the magic pill of how you find deep community, but I do think that deeper community comes through serving. I think serving is bigger than holding a door on a Sunday morning or serving in Remix or Kid Point. I think serving means, are we truly seeking the needs of others above ourselves? Because I think that sometimes we get a little lost in the shuffle. So I want you guys to flip to Philippians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, I'd love you to flip there. If you don't have a Bible, grab one in front of you or turn on your phone. I don't really care how you look at the text. I'd love you to look at it. I love looking at a paper Bible. Um, some of you don't think paper's cool anymore, and that's fine. But can you do this to your Kindle? Can you draw all over it? No, you can't. So maybe you can, but it can't come off. So don't do that. I, I want to give you guys a little bit of a background today. I think that true community, if you stick around the church long enough, true community is going to be found through serving with one another. And Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. He's writing it from jail uh, in you know, around 62 AD. He planted the church at Philippi a few years before that, and so he's writing them as their pastor, almost like a father to his son. And so Paul's writing this letter, encouraging the Philippians to carry on, to, to fight the fight, to finish the race, to stay strong in the midst of persecution and perseverance. Paul's telling them, like, stay the course. I know it's difficult, but stay the course. And so I want to read a couple of verses today. We're just going to be in Philippians 2. We're going to look at 11 verses, and then we're going to go home. Uh, and I want to study them with you. So let's take a look. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. I want to hang out here for just a second. Paul starts this passage with a bunch of questions, rhetorical questions, right? Like, is there any encouragement? Is there any comfort? Is there any fellowship? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? He starts off with these rhetorical questions that clearly have a pointing towards the answer, yes. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yes. Any comfort? Yes. Is there any, uh, any fellowship? Yes. Is there any sense of belonging? Yes. Is there any, uh, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Now look, I, I get it. Maybe you're a guy in the room and you're like, no, my heart is stone and I'm mean. I'm great. Good for you. High five. I'm just like you. That's great. However, what Paul's talking about is, do you care about others? Your heart is tender and compassionate, meaning do you love others as well as yourself? He's not saying like, do you cry at rom-coms? right? Our, I don't. I don't go to a rom-com and cry. Our lead pastor does, and that's fine. That's him. It's not me, so it's, it's fine. But here's the deal. What he's saying is, do you care about other people? Do you show a sense of tenderness and compassion to recognize that others need Jesus, that others need love, that others need people around them? So he asks all these questions kind of leading up to verse 2. It's kind of this if-then clause. If this is true, then make me happy. How do we do that? How do we find true happiness? Easy. You have one mind and one purpose. And what's that? Loving one another. Paul kind of opens this up with a real home run. If all this is true, then you ought to be of one mind and one purpose, and that purpose ought to be to love one another. He keeps going to verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others, too. So let's hang out here for just a second. He, he opens up by saying, you know, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. I get this. As a dude, this is my natural inclination is to try to impress 
people. We took our kids to the uh, Odenton uh, Fire Department, had a, a carnival this week, so we took them there last night. I grew up going to the carnival. I think carnivals are awesome. And so at the carnival, ran into a couple of ACC people that we did not know were going to be there. And uh, one of the dudes was like, hey, there's a punching bag over here. It shows you how hard you punch. Let's do it. I was like, yeah, I'll do that because I'm super strong. I got a lot of force behind me, right? Gained a little bit extra weight. And we're going to bring this thing home, right? So me and these two other dudes uh, walk over there, and I've got my whole family with me. And so, you know, I'm trying to make sure that my wife, you know, goes home with a strong man, you know? And so uh, they, they punch first, and the other guy punches, and then I come up, and y'all, I, like, I wish I could make this up, like I missed the bag. <laughs> so I come up, and like, you know, they're like, boom, boom, poof. <laughs> I got it, though, it's fine, I got it, I can't get the bag back. So, so they're like, you know, they're crushing it, my score's like 400, it's fine. So, so we're gonna, you know what? Let's do this again. Pull out. I'm like, how many more dollar bills do I have? We're going to do this until I win, right? So like, zip, zip. We're going to, so they come up, boop. Thing comes down. I'm like, all right, this time I'm the ball, right? So they come up, boom. They knock it down. They're harder than last time. I'm like, okay, crap. Boom, like almost 900. I'm like, all right, okay. All right, now we're going to have to really swing this thing. So I'm like, all right. So I come up, beep. Thing comes down, boom, hit it. I'm, I'm weaker than all three. All of, them. all of them make me look like a little girl. Hitting like a, eh. <laughs> and my wife is like, uh, mm, "Ooh, boy, kids' bedtimes, right? Like, we gotta go. We should probably, we should probably get going. Like, it's, ooh, it's getting late. Let's, um, you know what? It's fine, guys. Thanks so much. We're gonna head out. I'm super embarrassed by my awesomely strong husband. <laughs> I slept on the couch last night. It's fine, guys. It's fine. <laughs> We're working through it. All right. We're working through. It. Look, bottom line." Whenever you try to impress somebody, more often than not, you end up looking like a fool. You end up looking real stupid. So he just says, hey, don't be selfish, and also, uh, don't try to impress other people. And he keeps going, right? And he, he says something twice. Anything that's repeated is worth remembering. This is what he says. He says, think of others as better than you. And then he also, at the next line, says, take an interest in others, too. So how do we do this? How do we uh, seek out, how do we find this community? How do we find this deeper community? I think first and foremost, we serve other people. He says, put others' interest, think about others' interest. He says, make sure that they're on your mind, right? So I want to I share with you guys this really neat thing. So in the 15th century, there's a guy named Nicholas Copernicus. And Nicholas Copernicus dis- dis- discovered something incredible, that somehow or another, for the thousands of years that we've been alive, that we did not know that the earth was not the center of the universe. It's called the Copernican Revolution. It was the moment in time where we realized we weren't as important as we thought we were. That we revolved around the sun, not everything else around us. There's this uh, uh, next philosopher in the 20th century, Jean Piaget, that said this, every child needs to have his or her own Copernican Revolution. They must learn that they are not the center of their world. Some of you might say, some adults need to have their own Copernican revolution. I get it, and I agree. Here's the thing. We would all agree if you spend less than a minute with a kid, that they need to know that they are not the center of the world. I walked into Chick-fil-A. My, my family and I did dinner with, uh, one night there this week. We had a bunch of free stuff and went and ate there. And my daughter is walking through Chick-fil-A with no concern about anybody else that's walking in Chick-fil-A. And so everybody's got their trays like, okay, okay. You know what I'm talking Like, you know, you watch a kid walk and just hit you and be like, oh, yeah. They don't even say they're sorry. They just keep walking. Like, why were you there? You know what I mean? No concern for anybody else in the building. My son, uh, we had blown up some balloons for them to play with. My son chased a balloon out into a free-flowing parking lot to get it because he believed that all cars should stop when he walks out there, right? You, you can know for less than a second in a grocery store when a kid throws a tantrum, That that kid believes not that they need that thing, but that they are the center of the world and you need to give them that thing. Now, this is not a parenting advice thing, right? Look, at some points, give that kid that thing and shut them up. (laughs) Y'all know? I am not beneath bribery, fam. Do it. But more often than not, right, don't give in to their, uh, no, uh, no, just be like, be quiet. You're not the most important person in the room. 
we have to begin to teach them early, right? And some of us still need to be taught that day in and day out. And we are not the center of the universe. W.E. Gladstone, who was the prime minister of England, said it this way, that selfishness is the greatest curse to the human race. Selfishness is the greatest curse to the human race. So what does that mean for us? What's our application? I think it's really simple. When we live our lives to worship ourselves or live exclusively for ourselves, we are truly living in a prison. Now, how, how does that compute? If you've ever been in a prison before, you know that prison is pretty simple, right? You got four walls, you get to see whatever they tell you to see, and that's about it. This is the life that a lot of us live when we live with blinders on to everybody else. We live in a, in a prison. Only being able to see this small view of the world rather than the expanse that our freedom brings. So first and foremost, if we're going to do this, we have to learn to serve others. And then Paul answers the question as to how do we do that in verse 5. Check out what he says. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. And every tongue can declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what does that mean for us? How do we do that? We say this, that we reflect Christ. We reflect his attitude. Now does that mean that for us that we ought to tear ourselves down? That we ought to think less of ourselves and think more of everybody else? We're going through the uh, book of Philippians in our, our life group right now. And one of our life group members said it this way, and I, I really love the way that she worded it. She said, it doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It means that you think of yourself less. It doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It doesn't mean you tear yourself down. It doesn't mean you ruin who you are. It doesn't mean you go, oh, I'm awful. and what It doesn't mean that. It just means that you think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. You think about others a little bit more. This is the sense of reflecting Christ. That we're beginning to put others, not necessarily above our own. Look, Paul recognizes that you and I need to think about our own welfare to survive. But he's also saying, as you're thinking about yourself, are you thinking about other people? So how do we do that? Paul gives us a couple ideas. One, he says, to pursue humility. Pursue humility. Look at what he says here in verse 7, right? Instead of thinking that equality with God was something to be, be held on to, he gave up, right? This divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born a human being. He appeared in human form, and he humbled himself. He was obedient. These are all humble actions. Humility in this culture was something not to be proud of. Pride was something to be held on to. If you had money, if you had privilege, pride was what you ought to hang on to, not humility. Humility was equated, equated with slavery in the first century. So when Paul's writing that you ought to be humble, in essence, he's looking at these people and saying, everything that you know is the lowest form of life, that's what you should become. And for, you got to just think for a second, as a pagan living in the first century A.D., to put yourself down on the level of those who you're paying is 100% counterintuitive. I'm not going to go down there. Why would I do that? So Paul's saying, because Jesus, who is God, humbled himself and became like us. We reflect Christ. We pursue humility. Now before we go any further, I want to stop, I want to pause for just a minute, because well, we're going to move into the, into the second point in just a second. I want, to, I want to take kind of a sidebar, if I can, for just a minute. Recognizing the weekend and the importance and significance of the weekend, I think it's important for us to stop for a minute and recognize that there's a really good example of pursuing humility, and our second point is going to be selfless sacrifice. And I think it's displayed perfectly in this weekend, and I think I'd be remiss if we didn't address the fact that Memorial Day weekend is one of those weekends that we often take advantage of. Take advantage of because it's an extended weekend for school. We get to have cookouts and family over and everything else. We get to celebrate and rejoice in our freedom. But I think we also sometimes forget that that freedom wasn't free. 
Now, there are many for this weekend alone. The Memorial Day is the first time that they're going to do a holiday without that family member, without that son or that daughter, that husband, that wife, that child. And I just wonder this morning if we can just stop for a minute, reflect on that, and pray for those families. And maybe there's somebody in the room this morning, you're dealing with that, that's your struggle, and this weekend is difficult for you. While everybody else is rejoicing at a four-day weekend, you're mourning at the loss of somebody, a friend, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a daughter, or son. And I just want to acknowledge you and to pray for you before we continue on. You guys pray with me. Father, we just lift up to you right now, each one in this room or not in this room, those listening online or that will listen online later, we just ask, God, that you would be with them and their families right now. God, in this difficult weekend of remembrance of the sacrifice that these men and women have made on our behalf, recognizing that we don't get to sit in these chairs apart from them, that we stand on their shoulders today, recognizing that they are holding us up because of their sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus, we pray for comfort. We pray that you would surround the families this weekend that will be mourning. We pray that you would surround them with friends and family that love them, that you would surround them with your presence and your peace and your comfort in a time of difficulty. God, may we remember in this uh, a selfless sacrifice of these soldiers, the sacrifice that you also made on our behalf. God, we're thankful for all that you've done for us. We're thankful for these men and women. God, we love you in your name. Amen. I think first and foremost, we pursue humility. The ones who gave their lives for us to have this weekend pursued humility. They thought of others above themselves. Simon Sinek, a a great leader guru, said this. In the military, they give medals for people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. But in business world, they give bonuses to people who sacrifice others so that they may gain. And he makes makes the comment to say, it's not that the military is better or has better people, it's that it's a different environment. It's a different culture. It's a culture of sacrifice rather than a culture of greed. And I wonder this morning if maybe we need to begin pursuing humility above all else. Secondly, not only does he say to pursue humility, he says, secondly, that there ought to be a selfless sacrifice. If we want to find deeper community, not only do we pursue humility, but we ought to selflessly sacrifice ourselves. Now, what does that mean? Look at what he says in verse 7, right? He says he gave up. He sacrificed his divine privileges and took on the form of a slave instead, a servant instead. He says he gave that up. He he says in the next verse, in verse 8, right, that he humbled himself so much in obedience that he was executed for it. He gave up his life. Even though people who obey the law shouldn't be charged, right? Like people who disobey the law are the ones who should be receiving the penalty. And yet Jesus, even though in his obedience, received a penalty, our penalty, on our behalf. Our sacrifices that we make in our time, our talent, our treasure, the sacrifices that we make day in and day out, whether it's serving here at the church or serving somewhere during the week, serving your family, serving somebody else, those sacrifices are a reflection of what Christ has done on your behalf. It's a reflection. You're reflecting Christ. When you serve somebody else, you are becoming a visible attribute of God to a, of an invisible God. You're becoming the visible representation of who God intended us to become. You're allowing people to see Jesus in what you do day in and day out. And so what does that mean for us? Well, it means that we need to strive to selflessly sacrifice so that God is glorified to others through our lives. Not only do we pursue humility, but we ought to selflessly sacrifice our lives. Not only that, I think thirdly, we ought to genuinely worship. I think we're in a dangerous place in our society where we have hollowed out what worship looks like. And we've we've kind of reduced it to like, come, sit in a chair, stare at a screen, leave, come, serve upstairs, high five some kids, leave. And we've never really truly encountered God. We've never really truly had a genuine sense of awe before him. We've, We've made it a routine rather than real. So what does that mean for us? How do we do that? Well, look at what happens, right? Upon Jesus' pursuit of humility, upon his selfless sacrifice, God elevates him to the place of highest honor, verse 9. God gives him the name of all names, in verse 9. God, verse 10, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Verse 11, every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I don't know if you know too much about 
uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. I don't know how much research or what you've learned about it in the past, but the crucifixion of Christ was one of those things that you would have not wanted to be a part of. It was a humiliating and disgusting and graphic event. And I'm not going to go into it in detail this morning. I just want to give us a little bit of an idea of what happened. Because oftentimes, this idea of crucifixion was one of the most brutally uh, concocted death penalties. It wasn't uh, something where somebody would lay down and have like a little needle in their arm, three quick shots later, and they're dead. It wasn't that. Oftentimes, what would happen is these uh, men and women that were crucified would be crucified in the nude for all to see and be humiliated by. They would be crucified on beams that weren't like nice sanded down, pretty beams, because they would kill people so quickly that they would need to have just as many as possible. So oftentimes they were rough, so they would dig splinters into them as they were trying to grasp gasp for air, and oftentimes death would not come from the beatings, but would come from asphyxiation, whereby their lungs would just cease to be able to fill with air. They would place nails through their wrists and their feet to hold them on to the cross, and they would be there sometimes for days at a time, depending on the beating that ensued beforehand. And this wasn't done privately. It wasn't done like in a little corner in the back alley. This was done in public view for all to see. There were moments where thousands of yard or thousands of miles of of road would be covered with crosses to create a a point that as you walked into Rome, you knew you don't mess with Rome. Beach lines were covered uh, from the Persians. Beaches were covered with crucifix uh, of, of people being crucified, bones of people being crucified, so that as ships came in, they would divert and be like, nope, we're not going to do that. To think about what Jesus would have been crucified like, think if you went to a Rundle Mills on the busiest day, I think Black Friday, and you saw a crucifixion hanging out on top of there. That would have been similar to Jesus. Why? Because we recognize that Jesus was crucified on top of a mountain, Right, this Mount called Golgotha, he would have been carried up to the top, put up, and then all of Jerusalem would have seen, here's your king. Here's the king of kings that you claim. So that all could see on this Friday, Jesus' execution. But his humiliation became the grounds for our exaltation of him. His humiliation on that cross was what gives us hope for the future. Without his humiliation, I don't know for you and I, I don't know if we have the true depth of understanding the sacrifice that God has made on our behalf. But now because of his crucifixion, we're able to exalt him. God exalts him above all. See, when we come to the table selfishly, when we come into a relationship, a friendship, selfishly we leave unsatisfied when we come to a relationship thinking what can i get out of this we'll often leave a relationship thinking they didn't give me enough they weren't there when i needed them enough when we come to a relationship selflessly when we come to a relationship in a mode of servanthood then we leave with blessing and joy and deeper community than you could have ever imagined we stop focusing on what we can give and start focusing on how we can give it shifts our whole mentality so we end always with kind of this what now what does that mean for you and I this week what are some action steps we can take I think there's three that we can take depending on where you are this morning in the room but this morning you just need to, to become a little bit more humble I thank God for the men and women in my life that have stopped me in my tracks and told me to be quiet, sit down, and shut up. I'm telling you, Chris, 10 years ago, y'all would have punched in the throat. You would have not been around that guy. And I'm thankful for the men and women over the last, really, decade of my life who have brought perspective in my life to recognize, hey, man, you're being a real arrogant jerk right now. You should, you should be quiet. It saved my marriage. It saved a lot of those deep relationships. Because when you come to the table arrogant, you often leave the table alone. Secondly, maybe it's not you need to be humble. Maybe you're a super humble person. You shouldn't say that out loud. But maybe today you just need to become more obedient. In these last couple weeks, we talked about the importance of worshiping regularly and, and serving and being in life groups and all these things. Maybe today 
You just need to commit to say, I'm going to be here more. I'm going to serve. I'm going to, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's obedience. and like, I'm going to, I'm going to parent my child in such a way that brings about humility that reflects Christ. Like, I don't know what it is for you this morning. I don't know where you need to be obedient. But God's tugging at your heart saying like, this is it for you. You need to be obedient in this. Maybe you need to go talk to that person. You need to ask for forgiveness from that person. You need to, you need to be, I'm going to be here more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to whatever. Like, I don't know what it is for you. You know, God's tugging at your heart. So obey. Maybe today you just need to commit to, I'm going to be more mature. I'm going, to, I'm going to commit to grow in my faith. I'm going to practice spiritual discipline. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read. I'm going to, I'm going to fast. I'm going to study God's word. I'm going to get in a grow. I'm going to figure out how to grow. I'm going to, I'm going to do this the right way. Here's what I know. Why church? I've been talking about this the last five weeks. Why? Because I know that we're stronger when we're together there's strength in numbers. That belonging and acceptance is better than loneliness and surviving on an island by yourself. Why? Because life is hard and it comes at you. And if you don't have people around you, you will falter and you will fall. But we know that God has called us to something greater, something better, that we've been meant to live for way more than maybe we're even getting out of life now. That we've been meant to live for something incredible, community. All of us have a deep longing to belong, to find community, to find a hope, and that hope is found here. That hope is found in Jesus. Maybe today your step of obedience is saying, I need to start a relationship with God right now. I need to find community. And there's no greater place than here. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come, to listen, to fellowship, to grow to be challenged. I've got to ask for everybody in this room that you would give them boldness and courage to step out in faith. God, maybe today they need to become more humble. God, place people in their lives to, to humble them, to help them understand, God, how to grow in that. God, I pray for people who need to be obedient. Give them boldness and courage to step out in obedience, to say yes. God, I pray for those who need to grow in maturity. God, that you would surround them with people who help them grow. Put them in a life group. Put them in a group of of a few men or a few women who help them and challenge them to grow. God, whatever it is today, I pray that you would be in this place. You would surround them. God, that you would grow this church from the inside out. God, that you would allow our hearts to be tethered to you first and foremost. Jesus, work in this place in a mighty way for your glory and your honor. In your name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.